We have come today to the second part of a four-part lesson on the 10th Bible class concerning the book of Philippians that Paul wrote under house arrest in Rome while waiting to see whether he would be executed or not. In this case, he would be released uh, with God's help. And in spite of his condition, Paul greatly rejoices that the gospel is going forward no matter what. In this tenth and final lesson concerning verses 10 through 23 of Philippians chapter 4, we are focusing on this part, I have learned to be content, from which we take the title of the lesson, I have learned to be content in all circumstances, Paul said, and contentment or being satisfied with our circumstances, no matter what they are, is something that we must learn and we must practice if we're going to be uh, faithful disciples of Christ. In difficult circumstances, we think it is impossible for us to learn to be content, but the Apostle Paul made it clear that looking to God and being strengthened to God and knowing that things will work out for good that we may continue in God's service whether here or in eternity uh, where we will have that eternal home with God if we continue with him then we can realize that the circumstances that we're in will work out for the best and no matter how harsh or disturbing, they are but temporary. And we will continue in eternity to glorify God if we remain faithful and content in his service. So that's why these circumstances of difficulty many time, most times are allowed in our lives to see whether we are growing in patience, humility, and contentment and gratitude in continuing to serve him. But what about being content in prosperous circumstances? Notice what Jesus told a parable after an incident that we read about in Luke chapter 12 and verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or a, a, an arbiter over you? Verse 15, he says, Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, which not e which for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And that is an important verse. There is no security for the soul in an abundance of material things. Uh, just because we think we have more than enough to navigate this life and to have a comfortable life does not mean that we are right with God and have hope of eternal life. Then he tells the parable of the rich fool, a comparison to bring forth that principle that he just mentioned about you cannot be secured spiritually by an abundance of material things. Verse 16, And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and, th and there I will store all my grain and my goods. 
And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And so that was his grand plan, uh, that he might be secured, he thought, in his great abundance of material possessions. But verse 20, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man, Jesus said, who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In other words, you've missed it all because you have been deceived by the prosperous circumstances. You have been deceived into thinking that that made it all right with God, your condition of your soul, and that is not the case. That is not the case because God demands that we give our allegiance to him above all of these material things and we trust him to provide for those material things in a way uh, that will be best for us as we glorify and seek to serve him upon the earth above all. Contentment deceives when it comes because of our circumstances. And that is that we, what happens is instead of being, the contentment must be because of our relationship with God through Christ in spite of our circumstances. So it cannot be dependent upon prosperous circumstances. The contentment or satisfaction must be based upon serving Christ regardless of our circumstances. Hebrews 13 and verse 5, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? What will man do to me, he says? The Lord is my helper. And in Philippians 4 and verse 13, 13 I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so God is to be our provider, and we are to trust in God and not trust in material things. And this was the problem with the rich young ruler in Matthew 19 and verse 16. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments, Jesus said. Keep the commandments, verse 18, under the law of Moses at this time. Then he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness, Jesus said. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept, what is still lacking? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. 
<clears throat> but when the young man heard this, when he heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And so he was not willing to make the sacrifice that Jesus made in his particular case. He was deceived by his wealth and enticed by his wealth, and that would be the stumbling block for him. And although we are not required to sell all that we have today, we can be deceived by our prosperous circumstances and the being secured in those things and not living for God and putting him as the top priority in our lives as we should. Overcoming circumstances, determining my contentment, that is what we need to do. How can we know if circumstances are controlling whether we are content? Contentment is based upon a relationship with Jesus that will give us the heavenly perspective that we need to be content in every earthly circumstance, and that is the goal. Because earthly circumstances change. We're not always going to have pleasantness in our lives and material things, and so, but we are still commanded to be content in spite of those. Do we complain about our circumstances? Do we desire to have a better circumstance to be content? If we do, then we can realize that our contentment is not what it should be, a contentment in serving Christ no matter what. What is our greatest desire in this life? That will help answer it also, our greatest desire in this life. Paul did not complain. Whatever his circumstances were, he said, I have learned to be content. Going back to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, Paul said, that now at last, you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So the Apostle Paul did not complain. He learned to be content in the serving of his God, and that's what we must learn to do. God is to be glorified no matter what circumstance we may find ourselves in. In Luke 3 and verse 14, John the Baptist also uh, spoke to the complaining people and talked about serving God. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what about us? What shall we do? That is, to repent. And he said to them, Do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely. And be content, he said, with your wages. Don't complain. And that's a wonderful lesson for us. Don't complain. Second Corinthians 12 and verse 10, Paul said, Therefore I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions with difficulties for Christ's sake for when I am weak then I am strong Christ can still work in me the Apostle Paul said if I continue trusting him 
no matter what my circumstances may be. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8, he says, If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. How are we going to be content with those things? Even if we have a little shelter, a little clothing, in great difficulty, but we'll look at that again as we go through. Then... Earlier in Philippians, we read in Philippians 2 and verse 14, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you, among whom you appear as lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith I rejoice and share my joy with you all you too you too i urge you rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me so paul says we ought not to complain if we're going to learn to be content in whatever circumstances we are we do we desire a better circumstance to be content and we should not. We should not. Uh, Luke 12 and verse 19 again. And, and, and I will say to my soul, the rich fool said, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. That's the circumstance that he sought. And sometimes that's what we try to do. Secure our souls by... by an overabundance of material things. Verse 20 again, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And so we have the idea that we should not be focused upon better circumstances in order to be content. Whether we have much or little, we are to be content in serving God. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. That is what we are to do. God is the source of all things. We focus on him, the eternal, unchangeable God, who is good and merciful and powerful and loving and wise just, holy, merciful, gracious. We focus on him. He is the true source of life and the provider of everything that we need to serve him. 1 Timothy 6.18, instruct them to do good, that is, those who are blessed with riches, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. That is, they are to be rich in good works. Back to 1 Timothy 6 and verse 9, but those who want to get rich in to get rich, fall into temptation and a snare 
and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, that is, serving God above all, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. The idea is, the idea is that we must not be deceived by wanting better circumstances in order to be content. And falsely, many today are trying to teach the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that God wants Christians to be rich, and you ought not to be ashamed of that. You should pursue that. And that is the very opposite of what the scriptures teach. Can we desire something better and not be covetous? Well, let's look at that as we begin to draw the lesson to a close in this last point. Strongly desiring what belongs to someone else, that is the idea of coveting. Extreme or overwhelming desire to have it for the sake of having more, that is the idea of coveting in a bad way. And it is condemned in the Word of God, that type of coveting, <clears throat> to get someone else's possessions or to just make them an idol so that we don't know when we have enough. Exodus 20 and verse 17, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So even in the old law it was said, don't desire that of somebody else's that belongs to another. In the New Testament, the language is even stronger Colossians 3 and verse 1, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead, to immorality, impurity, past passion, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. And so that is the type of coveting we are not to do, when we don't know that we have enough of material things and when we're not using them, using them in a way to please God, to carry forth the work of the Lord's church and to help others uh, who are in need and to do good works, then they become an idol to us and they will destroy us, and our contentment will be lost. Colossians 3 and verse 6, For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them, and so were not to be involved in these type of coveting. Then go back as we draw the lesson to a close, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 and 7, or through 8. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. And that is a beautiful point. 
that the only way we can be truly content in this life is to focus our minds and our bodies on serving and glorifying God in whatever way he has demanded that we should do, no matter what our physical circumstance may be. That is how we learn and practice satisfaction or contentment with our present circumstances in this life. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either, Paul said. Verse 8, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. And again, verses 9 through 11, but those who want to get rich fall into temptations and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness, all relating to serving God. So this is how we are to be content, not complaining, not seeking better circumstance, but whatever circumstance we are in, to be thankful to God and focus our minds and our efforts on serving God that he may be honored no matter what our circumstance may be in this life. We're going to close our Bible class today for now and look forward to part three. The Lord willing, uh, it might be in two weeks because we have another lesson that we will preach here with the Lakeview Church on Sunday night, the Lord willing. I don't know exactly the topic, but we will post that, Lord willing, early next week, and then we will get back uh, the, the following week, the Lord willing, or whenever we post it regarding this lesson uh, on Philippians uh, being content as we close these lessons, uh, our study in this wonderful letter of rejoicing and contentment. If you have never become a Christian, we would encourage you to not be deceived by thinking you might have been saved by the sinner's prayer or by infant baptism, and that may be a shocking statement. We had a little technical difficulty where the last part or very last part of the lesson was not recorded properly. I hope this will be. But I was encouraging all as we draw the Bible class today to a close to become a Christian if we're not already Christians. And we were pointing out that in the book of Acts, the scripture is quite clear that those who believed in Jesus as the Son of God, that God sent Jesus to die for our sins, that God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day and seated him at his right hand, and that God has seated him there ruling over heaven and earth where he is ruling as king of all, lord of all, even today. Those who believe that and believe he is God along with the Father and the Holy Spirit were commanded to repent of their sins and to be confess that faith in Jesus as the Son of God before men and then something that is often neglected, they were commanded to be baptized, immersed in water, in the name of Jesus, by his authority for the forgiveness of their sins, that they might be spiritually 
baptized that they might be immersed into Jesus' death, to be cleansed by his blood through faith in Jesus, be buried with him in baptism, fully immersed in water, that they might be raised up out of the water by the power and mercy of God through the blood of Jesus to walk in newness of life as newborn children of God. If you've never done that, whenever you may be listening to this lesson, we would encourage you to do that before it is ever too late and not be deceived by any of those false ways of salvation that we mentioned earlier. And those who are already been baptized into Christ, let us remember that we are to continue steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, seeking to follow the will of God. But we are, when we fall back into sin, which we often do, we, we as fallen Christians are to repent and pray, confessing our sins to God that we may be forgiven of those things and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. If anyone who may be listening to this is subject to the gospel invitation in order to be saved as a becoming a Christian or in order to be restored back as a fallen Christian, we would encourage all to respond and we would be glad to help you in any way to do so if you will contact us by phone, text, or email however you can, or message at the website at biblesearch.com. Whatever you can do to contact us, we'll try our best to help you or find someone near you that can help you continue to learn and obey uh, the gospel of Christ as presented in the New Testament. If you're here today and subject to that invitation or at any time, we would encourage you to respond as today we draw our Bible class to a close.